In 1609, Galileo Galilei seemed to be at a personal and professional plateau. He had been the chair of mathematics at Padua University for 17 years. After making a name for himself as a brilliant up-and-coming academic at the university in his hometown of Pisa, Galileo had managed to secure the more prestigious post in Padua in 1592. The university and the entire town of Padua, for that matter, fell under the auspices of the Serene Republic of Venice. While historians usually place the height of Venetian power a few centuries before Galileo's time, in the late 16th century, the city of Venice still commanded a large trading empire throughout the Mediterranean. Their navy was one of the most formidable in Europe, although it was now rivaled by the likes of Spain. The city had a reputation for easygoing attitudes, flexible boundaries between the classes, and a world-class party scene. In other words, it was Galileo's kind of town. While a professor at Padua, he spent plenty of time in the big city carousing with his friends. Along the way, he ended up falling for a woman who, because of class concerns, he felt he could not marry. But that didn't stop him from having three children with her. While Galileo was a respected professor, he was always struggling with money. As the chair of mathematics, he made a respectable 500 crowns a year. But to keep up appearances, he was obliged to keep two separate houses in Padua, one for himself and another for his children and their mother. He provided for them financially, but also kept them conveniently out of view. After the death of his father, Galileo also found himself on the hook for his sister's dowry. His younger brother, Michelangelo, was supposed to have chipped in for the dowry payments, but he never seemed to come through. Michelangelo had followed in his father's footsteps and had become a musician. Despite getting some notable opportunities playing in courts around Europe, he always seemed to be broke. So Galileo found himself constantly lending his brother money or shipping him new loots. Galileo's family, legitimate or otherwise, were expensive, and those 500 crowns had a way of going fast. By 1609, the scientist was frustrated that his pay from the university remained modest, while other academics he deemed less impressive were getting better compensated. He was also frustrated that his many inventions hadn't really earned him much money. This was mostly because his inventions tended to be highly specific scientific instruments that could only really be used by a handful of specialists. Meanwhile, his peers were creating simpler but better marketed devices that were making fortunes. He was worried that while things could be worse, his career had stalled. Then he heard a rumor. In the Netherlands, an eyeglass maker named Hans Lipperse had applied for a patent on a special device. It was essentially a long tube that made faraway objects appear close at hand. It was not yet known by this name, but Lipperse was trying to patent the telescope. Now, interestingly, the Dutch Patent Office denied him this patent because they claimed that knowledge of this device already seemed to be ubiquitous. Indeed, a few weeks later, another Dutch inventor named Jacob Metius also applied for a patent on a very similar device. Within a few months, there were reports that telescope-like devices were being sold as expensive toys in Paris. In 1609 in Italy, the device was still little more than a rumor whispered about by diplomats who could easily foresee the telescope's military applications. That is, assuming it was real and it worked. Then one day, while Galileo was visiting friends in Venice, he heard that an unnamed Dutchman had arrived in the city carrying one of these instruments. The visitor was hoping to get an audience with the Doge of Venice, the leader of the Republic. He hoped to sell his device to the Venetian military and hopefully make a fortune. When Galileo heard this, he was determined not to let another opportunity slip through his fingers. 
So the Wrangler flew into action. He rushed home to Padua and immediately met with a local glassblower. Because, you know, every eminent professor needs to have a glass guy. You see, while Galileo had never seen a telescope, he understood enough about optics to guess at how the device functioned. By the end of the day, the glassblower had cut a collection of lenses for Galileo to experiment with. The story goes that he stayed up all night, fitting various combinations of lenses into a lead tube, making adjustments, and shaping the glass in his home workshop. He would later claim in his writings that in 24 hours, he had invented a working telescope that could magnify faraway objects by three times. Now, Galileo was known to exaggerate especially when it came to his own genius. He would also later claim that he had come up with the idea for the telescope 10 years earlier, but he just never got around to making one. Did he actually whip up his first prototype in 24 hours? Mm, It's hard to say. But we do know that after a day of experimenting, he sent a letter to one of his connected friends in Venice, telling him that he was very close to a breakthrough. Galileo believed that he needed two weeks to perfect his design. In that time, he needed that high-ranking friend to make sure that this Dutch inventor did not get an audience with the Doge. Well, this friend happened to be just well-placed enough in the Republic that he would be able to successfully run defense for Galileo, at least for a little while. Through some clever delay tactics, he could keep this Dutch fellow away from anyone who mattered in government, but it couldn't go on forever. In two weeks, Galileo had better have something to show, because after that point, it might be impossible to delay the man any further. Two weeks passed, and Galileo did not disappoint. On August 20th, 1609, he emerged from his workshop with an instrument that was roughly an arm's length long, outfitted with two two two-inch lenses. But just having a working telescope wasn't enough. Galileo needed a little razzle-dazzle. Not only was he able to use his connections to get an audience with the Doge, but the event was hyped up to every senator and important luminary in the city. By the time Galileo arrived in Venice with his telescope, anticipation among the local elite could not have been higher. When the Doge finally received Galileo at the Palace of the Signoria, Venice's primary government building, he found it packed with excited Venetian dignitaries, including the men who commanded the Venetian navy, known as the Sages of the Order, which may be the most badass title ever. Leave it to the serene Republic of Venice to give everyone a title that makes them sound like a wizard. We are the sages of the order, commanders of the navy. The doge greeted Galileo with much ceremony, and the dignitaries listened intently as Galileo explained his new instrument's operation. But the real show would be the live demonstration. Galileo led the Doge and his entourage out of the Palace of the Signoria, across the piazza, and up the Tower of St. Mark's, the grand bell tower in front of St. Mark's Cathedral. At the top of the tower, Galileo set up his instrument and allowed the dignitaries to take turns looking through it. First, the telescope was pointed towards Padua, where the device had been constructed, some 35 miles or 56 kilometers away. One by one, the Venetians took turns peering into the device, and they were amazed, as there, in the eyepiece, they clearly spied the Tower of St. Justina, Padua's main bell tower. Then they started examining small towns even further in the distance, Towns up to 50 miles or 80 kilometers away came into view in the telescope. Most impressive for the sages of the order was when the device was pointed out to sea and the sails of faraway ships could be glimpsed. 
ships that would not be visible to the naked eye in Venice for another two hours. The military applications of such a device were obvious. But Galileo's masterstroke came a few days later. Instead of crassly trying to sell his new invention on the spot, Galileo returned to the Signoria and quite gallantly made a gift of the new device to the Doge, complete with a pamphlet he had just written explaining how to use it. Why give away an instrument that the Republic of Venice surely would have compensated him for? Well, Galileo knew that they were eventually going to want more than one telescope. If he tried to sell it to the Doge, the crass transaction may have sent the Doge looking for a cheaper option. A gallant gift meant that the Doge was now predisposed to go to Galileo for all future telescopes. And indeed he did. What's more, Galileo presented the telescope as a great symbol of Venetian ingenuity and the scientific genius being cultivated in their University of Padua. The Doge was so honored that he agreed to give Galileo, the man bringing glory to Venice, a sizable raise. He doubled his pay from 500 to 1,000 crowns a year. This was to say nothing of the money Galileo would receive for all the future telescopes he would build for the Venetians. The Wrangler had done it again. Meanwhile, somewhere in Venice, there sat an angry Dutchman holding a telescope, cursing the name Galileo. You see, one of the most pervasive myths about Galileo is that he invented the first telescope— now, this is entirely untrue. In fact, he would have never rushed one into completion had it not been for the fact that someone else had already created the first telescope. As for who that person actually was, well, that's a bit more complicated. Hans Lippersee seems to have been the first person to try and patent a telescope-like device. But as I said earlier, it's notable that his patent was denied because the patent office determined that too many similar devices were already out there. The telescope was one of those inventions that was just kind of in the air in the early 1600s. Now, to be fair to Galileo, he never personally claimed to have invented the first telescope. In his writings, he's very clear that he had heard about a similar device created by a Dutch inventor. But other people were more than happy to give Galileo credit. In fact, the Republic of Venice went so far as to issue an official proclamation in 1609 declaring that Galileo Galilei had invented the as-yet-unnamed telescope. Galileo made the biggest splash when he unveiled his telescope, and its dramatic debut led to the mistaken belief that it must have been the very first telescope ever. This is often the case in the history of invention. As we've seen before on this podcast, it's one thing to fly your plane on a deserted sand dune, it's another to take off over the heads of the cheering multitudes in a crowded Paris park. These days, most responsible writers will point out that Galileo did not invent the telescope. But you may still come across the claim that Galileo was the first person to point his new invention towards the night sky. Well, it turns out that isn't entirely true either. The English astronomer Thomas Harriot used a telescope to make observations about the surface of the moon a few months before Galileo trained his instrument on the same celestial body. So, Galileo didn't invent the first telescope, nor was he the first to train it on the sky. But, when Galileo finally did point his telescope upwards, his breakthroughs were truly remarkable. As we've seen before on this podcast, it's not always about doing things first, it's about doing them memorably. So what exactly did Galileo see when he peered through his telescope up at the night sky? 
How were these discoveries received? Did his astronomical observations get him branded a heretic right out of the gate? Or is the story a bit more complicated than that? Let's find out today on Our Fake History. Episode number 164, What Was the Galileo Affair, Part 2. Hello and welcome to Our Fake History. My name is Sebastian Major and this is the podcast where we explore historical myths and try to determine what's fact, what's fiction, and what is such a good story that it simply must be told. Before we get going this week, I want to remind everyone listening that an ad-free version of this show is available at patreon.com slash ourfakehistory. Sign up at $5 or more every month and you will get access to an ad-free feed and every other piece of extra content that I currently have on offer. If you like the show, you want to support us, and you want all those juicy extras, then please head over to patreon.com slash ourfakehistory. Another awesome way to support the show is to buy some merch from our T Public store. The store has just been updated with a number of new designs that you can get on t-shirts, hoodies, mugs, tote bags, and all sorts of other bric-a-brac. All the designs come from the original episode art created for the show by my friend, collaborator, and all-around awesome dude, Frank Fiorentino. Now, depending on which app you are using to listen to our fake history, you may or may not be seeing the individual episode art. If you're not seeing it, it's a real shame. The art is always spectacular. So if you are curious what it looks like, then please go to OurFakeHistory.com and check it out. Frank is a comic book artist at heart, and all his art has this very cool comic book feel. I absolutely love it. The new designs at the Tee Public store look amazing on t-shirts, and they make awesome gifts for the OFH fan in your life. So, check out the new designs at tpublic.com slash stores slash our dash fake dash history, or go to ourfakehistory.com and follow the link to the store. Okay, this week we are continuing our look at the controversial life of one of the most important figures in the history of science, Galileo Galilei. As you've hopefully already put together, this is part two of what is going to be a three-part series on Galileo. If you haven't listened to part one, then I strongly suggest that you go back and give that a listen now. In the last show, I introduced the idea that Galileo's life story has been presented as a kind of modern myth. The complexities of his life and ultimate conflict with the church are sometimes sanded away to make him appear as a quote-unquote martyr of science. I pointed out that this view of Galileo is deeply influenced by an old-fashioned style of history writing that's been called the Whig interpretation of history. This was a type of history writing especially popular in Britain in the 19th century that saw human history since the Middle Ages as being defined by steady progress towards scientific enlightenment and political liberty. While Whig history has been out of fashion among academic historians for decades, I would argue that its influence has lingered on in history textbooks, historically themed media, and popular understandings of history to this very day. It was a 19th century historian who first called Galileo a martyr of science, And that perception is certainly alive and well today. But that's not to say that Galileo wasn't important and didn't live a truly fascinating life. Because he was, and he did. 
In part one, we looked at his early life and the legends that grew out of his early academic career at the University of Pisa. We learned that stories of Galileo having a eureka moment while watching a swinging lantern in church and conducting flashy experiments from the top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa are most likely historical myths. But I still found myself fascinated and entertained by the real details of Galileo's young life. I love that his nickname was The Wrangler. He had a reputation for being irreverent, and he had a caustic sense of humor. Today, I want to spend some time looking closely at Galileo's most significant astronomical discoveries and start unpacking his eventual conflict with the Roman Catholic Church. You see, in 1610, Galileo published Sidereus Nuncius, his short book detailing his groundbreaking astronomical observations. Now, those who are only familiar with the popular myth of Galileo might assume that a reactionary and controlling church establishment immediately condemned the scientists' remarkable findings. But interestingly, that isn't at all how things played out. Notably, Galileo would not be tried by the Holy Office for heresy until the year 1633. Why was his work tolerated for over two decades before he finally found himself at the mercy of the Inquisition? Well, let's see what we can find out. Today's episode of Our Fake History is being brought to you by Cabinets to Go. Do people see your kitchen and say, wow? If not, then you need to visit cabinetstogo.com to request their free custom 3D design and quote for a kitchen makeover that wows for a whole lot less than you'd think. As seen on HGTV's Dream Home, cabinetstogo.com is your one-stop shop renovation destination. They have everything you need from design to installation, with 200,000 cabinets available and ready to ship. Your wow kitchen can be complete in weeks, not months. Now, one thing that I think is cool about cabinets.com is how it does this 3D design process for you. So you really get to see your kitchen with new cabinets before you order them. I don't know. It's something I would like if I was getting new cabinets for my home. So right now, get a full custom 3D design of your new kitchen at cabinets2go.com slash OFH. That's a free custom 3D design of your new wow kitchen at cabinets2go.com slash OFH. In September of 1609, a few weeks after gifting his first telescope to the Doge of Venice, Galileo had new, more powerful lenses cut for his latest models. By the early fall, Galileo's telescopes were 400 times more powerful than the instrument he first demonstrated in Venice. It was at this time that he first hauled one of his telescopes to the top floor of his house in Padua and pointed it towards the night sky. Over the next few months, he started making careful observations of the moon, bright sections of the night sky, like the Milky Way, and the known planets. Now, before we get into what exactly Galileo observed with his telescope, I think it's worthwhile to speak a little bit about the scientific and religious context of the early 1600s. First and foremost, it's important to recognize that in the early 17th century, Europe was still grappling with the Protestant Reformation that had begun nearly a century earlier. Now, 
It is beyond the scope of this series on Galileo for us to really get into all the causes and political and spiritual consequences of the Reformation. But it's important that we recognize just how massive the split in the Western church was for the history of Europe and, quite frankly, the history of the world. In 1517, the German priest Martin Luther famously published his 95 Theses, criticizing some controversial practices of the 16th century church. His excommunication opened up a new fault line within Western Christianity. Aside from his criticisms of corruption within the priesthood, Luther also proposed bold new interpretations of Christian theology. This inspired a number of other religious thinkers who were soon articulating their own interpretation of the scriptures. By the end of the 16th century, there were dozens of new religious movements broadly lumped together as Protestants, gaining adherence throughout Western Europe. Kings, dukes, and other leaders were soon picking sides in this split, and for the next century, questions of religion were one of the leading causes of war in Europe. <laughs> How's that for a thumbnail sketch? But for our story, we need to understand a little bit about the Roman Catholic Church's response to this massive challenge to their traditional authority. Not only had the Reformation diminished Rome's political authority in Europe, as various monarchs and other leaders embraced Protestantism, but these Protestant denominations were articulating new forms of theology. The Bible was being translated into German, English, French, and other languages spoken by the common people of Europe. Protestants were challenging the traditional canon of biblical scripture. Ideas around the nature of salvation, the sacraments, the veneration of the saints, and even the nature of God were being radically reimagined and transformed by the various Protestant denominations that came in Luther's wake. One of the ways that the Roman Catholic Church responded to the challenge was with a massive ecumenical council that stretched on for 18 years known as the Council of Trent. Everything that came out of the Council of Trent is sometimes referred to as the Counter-Reformation. Over the course of these 18 years, the leaders of the Roman Catholic Church embarked on some much-needed reforms and a crackdown on corruption within the clergy. But they also used it as an opportunity to reaffirm and in some cases strengthen their traditional authority. This meant condemning various Protestant groups and teachings as heretical. This aligned with a new vigor to persecute heresy in general, whether Protestant or some other variety. The Council of Trent also saw the Church Fathers clarify and standardize a number of points of theology. The idea was there couldn't be any more dissension or difference of opinion between churchmen on important religious questions. Theological debate could happen at the council, but once a matter was settled, that was it. From the Roman Catholic perspective, Protestantism had created a dangerous confusion around the truth of Christianity. If the Roman Catholic Church was going to survive, at the very least, it needed to be clear and consistent when it came to what it believed. Galileo grew up as a Roman Catholic at a time when the church was redefining and reasserting itself by way of the Counter-Reformation. Now, with all of that going on, you would think that when in 1543 the Polish mathematician Nicholas Copernicus published his groundbreaking book, on the revolutions of the celestial spheres, it must have met with immediate condemnation. In that book, Copernicus laid out his mathematical proofs demonstrating that the earth revolved around the sun. Now, he published that book just two years before the Council of Trent got underway. And one of the things that came out of the Council of Trent was the infamous Index of Prohibited Books. 
the Counter-Reformation was defined by a new era of censorship and the banning of books. And yet somehow, amazingly, Copernicus's book, which repudiated the idea that the earth was at the center of creation, was not banned by the Roman Catholic Church. In fact, when Galileo first started his astronomical observations in 1609, on the revolutions of the celestial spheres, remained off the index. Copernicus himself had actually been quite hesitant to publish his book in the first place, as he understood that its central thesis, that the best math showed that the earth revolved around the sun, could have been ruled as heretical. So he waited until he was quite old and ailing before he sent it to press. Sure enough, once the book was available, there were many who condemned it as sinful and heretical. Interestingly, many of the most vociferous early critics of Copernicus's work were Protestant and not Roman Catholic. You see, Copernicus's book may have been saved from outright condemnation by the Catholic Church because Copernicus dedicated the book to Pope Paul III. Furthermore, a preface was added to the book by the printer, Copernicus's friend, Andreas Osiander. Osiander went even further in trying to protect his friend. His unsigned preface to the book basically said that this was just for mathematicians only and not for general reading. But even more significantly, Osiander wrote that everything in the book was purely hypothetical this wasn't the truth, just a hypothesis that might be interesting to specialists. He wrote, quote, These hypotheses need not be true nor even probable. If they provide a calculus consistent with the observations, that alone is enough. End quote. The implication was that it was a scientist's job to make observations and do calculations and it was the church's job to decide what was true. Osiander sums up by saying, quote, As far as these hypotheses are concerned, let no one expect anything certain from astronomy, which cannot furnish it. End quote. It's hard to know if it was this strategic preface that kept on the revolutions of the celestial spheres off the prohibited book's index. But what is clear is that the Roman Catholic Church was willing to tolerate its existence for decades. It was only until after Galileo published his findings in 1610 that the Church finally made an official ruling on the Copernican position. The official cosmology accepted by the Roman Catholic Church in the early 17th century was essentially the image of the heavens that had been described by Aristotle. This was a system where the earth was at the center, and all the heavenly bodies, the sun, the moon, the planets, revolved around the earth. This was the cosmology that Dante described so poetically in his Divine Comedy. The planets and the stars were permanently embedded in crystal spheres that elegantly revolved in the ether. This conception was then duly supported with biblical evidence that seemed to suggest that the earth was indeed the center of creation. This Aristotelian cosmology was then complemented by the work of Ptolemy, the Alexandrian astronomer from the 2nd century AD. Ptolemy proposed a more mathematically complex system, but it agreed with Aristotle's premise that the earth was at the center. Now, Interestingly, the Ptolemaic system and the Aristotelian system were not always perfectly consistent. Sometimes they contradicted one another. And so, in the 16th century, debates around which cosmological system was ultimately more correct were common among mathematicians and philosophers. One of Galileo's contemporaries, the Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe, proposed his own novel cosmological system. He suggested that while the sun revolved around a stationary earth, all the other planets revolved around the sun. 
So this is the context in which Galileo was operating when, in 1610, he published his astronomical observations in a slim volume titled Sidereus Nuncius, which is usually translated as the sidereal messenger or the starry messenger. I personally prefer the starry messenger, so that's what I'm going to be calling it. The Reformation and the Counter-Reformation meant that the Roman Catholic Church was at its most censorious. The Pope at the time, Pope Paul V, also had a reputation as a staunch conservative. And yet, somewhat surprisingly, there was a certain level of tolerance when it came to debates around astronomy. You were free to discuss Copernicus, so long as you kept things hypothetical— There's this idea that the church wanted to destroy science, but that's not exactly right. Many of the accomplished scientists of the day were monks, priests, and other clergymen. Some of the best astronomers were Jesuits. But at the end of the day, the church did get to decide what was true, or rather, how scripture should be interpreted considering scientific findings. Astronomy was fine, so long as the astronomer did not fancy himself a theologian. So, how did Galileo fit into all of this? Well, in The Starry Messenger, Galileo laid out a number of astronomical observations that he made with his telescope in Padua over the course of a few months in late 1609 and early 1610. Of these observations, there were three in particular that were especially groundbreaking. The first had to do with the moon. With his telescope, Galileo could see that the surface of the moon was quite a lot more like the surface of the earth than had been previously assumed. You see, according to our old friend Aristotle, the heavens began at the moon. He had argued that the earth was a place of constant change, where things were in a state of becoming and decaying. In other words, it was a place of corruption. Aristotle believed that the heavens and all heavenly bodies were exactly the opposite. They were uncorrupted, permanent, and unchanging. It followed that all the celestial bodies should therefore take the most perfect geometric shape, a smooth, unblemished sphere. Now, the moon was always an odd exception to this rule, because with the naked eye, one could see that the moon was pockmarked and filled with light and dark patches. You know, there's a man in the moon. Now, I have scoured my copy of Aristotle's book on astronomy, On the Heavens, to see how he explained this. But as far as I can tell, he didn't comment on it. The Galileo Project website claims that Aristotle believed that because the moon was close to the corrupted earth, the moon partook in that corruption, hence all the strange patches on it. But I personally couldn't find that supported in On the Heavens. If someone else can track down that passage, please be my guest. Christian and Islamic thinkers that came after Aristotle were persuaded that the moon was indeed a perfect, unblemished sphere. Some speculated that the shapes we see in the moon were either reflections of Earth's corruption or were created by vapors lurking between the Earth and the moon. But it was widely held in both the Christian and Islamic worlds for many centuries that the moon was a pure, perfect heavenly body. Galileo's observations directly challenged that idea. Through the telescope, he could see what seemed like mountains and valleys. There were huge indentations in the moon's surface that he likened to Earth's seas. This heavenly body was not some smooth, polished surface. It had topography. The next key observation had to do with the stars. When Galileo turned his telescope towards the Milky Way, he was able to see that it was in fact made up of thousands of individual stars. 
Furthermore, there were stars that appeared in his telescope that could not be seen with the naked eye. Now, this observation was less threatening to the widely held cosmological thinking of the day. However, it did suggest a bit of a theological puzzle. If the stars in the heavens had been made by God for the pleasure of human beings, then what was the point of stars that could not be seen with the naked eye? Now, this question wasn't necessarily disastrous for the church. The great church thinkers had certainly resolved more complex theological problems than the issue of invisible stars. But this gets us closer to the nature of the controversy created by Galileo. The fact that these observations could be used to challenge conventional Roman Catholic theology was provocative, but not necessarily heretical. The bigger question was who would get to interpret these findings? Would the church get to say what all this meant? Or would the scientist explain the significance of these things? Galileo also wrote that through his telescope, he had been able to perceive a hard edge when he looked at the planets. He could see their spherical shape quite clearly. By contrast, when he looked at the stars, he couldn't make out a clear edge. Galileo proposed that this meant that the fixed stars were actually much further away from Earth than the planets. Put simply, he could see the planets better, so they had to be closer. But the biggest bombshell had to do with his observations of Jupiter. After carefully observing the planet, he had noticed three points of light that he originally described as small stars. But after watching these tiny stars for many nights, it became clear to him that they were orbiting Jupiter he had discovered Jupiter's three largest moons. Now, to be clear, Galileo never used the term moon to describe these celestial bodies. He called them stars. But he clearly explained that all his observations had demonstrated that Jupiter had satellites that revolved around it. This discovery was particularly groundbreaking because in both the Ptolemaic and and the Aristotelian systems, everything was supposed to revolve around the earth. If there were objects in the heavens revolving around Jupiter, that challenged one of the most basic premises of the entire system. But here's the thing. In The Starry Messenger, Galileo was careful not to draw any conclusions concerning the implications of his observations. He simply states what he observed and how he observed it. He also includes some helpful hand-drawn pictures of the moon, a few constellations, and Jupiter's satellites. But here's what he does not say. In light of these observations, we must now all accept the truth first demonstrated by Nicholas Copernicus. Nor does he say my observations make it clear that Aristotle was wrong. Instead, he simply presents his observations and submits them to, quote, the judgment and criticism of all true philosophers, end quote. So, what was the reaction? What did those true philosophers have to say about the starry messenger? Well, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll look at how this little pamphlet changed Galileo's life. Today's episode of Our Fake History is being brought to you by Indeed. When you're hiring, you're supposed to leave no stone unturned. But how do you actually do that? Easy. 
partner with one powerful stone turner. You need Indeed. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Don't spend hours on multiple job sites looking for candidates with the right skills when you can do it all with Indeed. Find top talent fast with Indeed's suite of powerful hiring tools like Indeed Instant Match, Assessments, and Virtual Interviews. In fact, one of the things I like best about Indeed is the virtual interview tool because you don't need to download anything extra. Your candidates can just click and you are talking. There's nothing worse than making your candidate jump through a hoop to download something new. Indeed makes it easy to connect. Indeed knows when you're growing your own business, you have to make every dollar count. That's why when you sponsor a job, you only pay for quality applications from resumes in our database matching your job description. Visit indeed.com slash our fake history to start hiring right now. Just go to indeed.com slash our fake history. Indeed.com slash our fake history. Terms and conditions apply. Cost per application pricing not available for everyone. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Today's episode of Our Fake History is being brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Let's face it, sometimes multitasking can be overwhelming, like when your favorite podcast is playing and the person next to you is talking or your car fan is blasting, all while you're trying to find that perfect parking spot. But then again, sometimes multitasking is easy, like quoting with Progressive Insurance. They do the hard work of comparing rates so you can find a great rate that works for you, even if it's not with them. Give their nifty comparison tool a try and you might just find getting the rate and coverage you deserve is easy. All you need to do is visit Progressive's website to get a quote with all the coverages you want, like comprehensive or collision coverage or personal injury protection. Then you'll see Progressive's direct rate and their tool will provide options from other companies all lined up and ready to compare so it's simple to choose the rate and coverages you like. Press play on comparing auto rates. Quote at Progressive.com to join the over 27 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. There are many things that strike the modern reader when flipping through Galileo's starry messenger. One thing that really struck me was its brevity. It gets called a book, but it was really just a big pamphlet. I encourage you to go read it for yourself. You can find it online through the Gutenberg Project, and I'll link to it on the website. You can breeze through it real fast. But its brevity makes it feel very familiar to those of us used to reading things on the internet. Now, once again, I don't mean to take Galileo out of his historical context. Short punchy publications were very much a product of the printing culture of the 16th and 17th centuries. But the final line of the starry messenger is, quote, Want of time prevents my going further into these matters. My readers may expect further remarks upon these subjects in a short time, end quote. And that's it. <laughs> there isn't some grand sign-off or a poetic summation of his discoveries, It's just him going, okay, uh, I'm out of time, so uh, more soon. (laughs) How many times have you read a blog post that basically ends like that? Or watched a YouTube video where the host is like, I don't have time to go any deeper into that now, so stay tuned for more videos soon. But if the end of the pamphlet feels very 21st century, the dedication that begins the Starry Messenger feels very 17th century. Galileo used his dedication very strategically because you know the wrangler gonna wrangle. Now, you might expect that this starry messenger would be dedicated to someone like the Doge of Venice, the man who had just doubled Galileo's yearly salary and who had been publicly hailing him as the most brilliant mind in the Serene Republic. But no, Galileo dedicated this book 
to Cosimo II de' Medici, the Grand Duke of Florence. What's more, he dubbed those new moons of Jupiter the Medician Satellites, after the Medici family. The largest moon was named for Cosimo, and all the others were named for his siblings. Now, why did he do this? Well, as I said in part one, Galileo always saw himself as a Florentine, so there was a little hometown pride factoring into this decision. But more importantly, this was done to wrangle an even better job than the one he had in Padua. Even though Galileo was now the toast of the serene Republic of Venice, the truth was he didn't love teaching. He was interested in pursuing his own research and writing. Despite his talent as a lecturer, he found himself annoyed by the typical obligations of a university professor. Instead, he wanted a court position in Florence. That would essentially mean that the Duke of Tuscany would become his patron. The Duke would pay him to continue making amazing discoveries and inventing wonderful devices that would bring yet more glory to Florence. Well, the gambit paid off. The flattery of having the moons of Jupiter named after his august family delighted Cosimo II. The dedication at the beginning of the Starry Messenger, along with a few other strategic entreaties to Florence, worked exactly as intended. Before the end of 1610, Galileo had been officially appointed as the court mathematician and philosopher of Florence. The Venetians were pissed. (laughs) They had quite literally just given Galileo a massive raise, and then he jumps ship? I can just picture the Doge of Venice getting the news that Galileo is heading to Florence and just cursing under his breath, the Wrangler. But the real reason that Galileo was able to write his own ticket in 1610 was because the Starry Messenger had been such a massive sensation. Every scientist working in Europe at the time took note. And soon, other notable astronomers from across the continent had confirmed Galileo's observations. Now, while Galileo had been careful not to expound on the implications of his observations in The Starry Messenger, other scientists and writers were very quickly drawn to the conclusions that were implied by Galileo. In particular, Galileo's friend and brilliant fellow astronomer, Johannes Kepler, was soon publishing work arguing that Galileo's observations had clearly demonstrated that Copernicus had been correct, and Aristotle and Ptolemy's conception of the cosmos could no longer be accepted. These claims were obviously provocative, but because Galileo was not making them himself, for the time being, he did not attract the ire of the Catholic Church. Instead, He was the focus of waves of effusive praise from every corner of Europe. Galileo's quote-unquote invention of the telescope, coupled with the publication of the Starry Messenger, had within a few months rocketed him to a new level of fame. He went from being a respected but somewhat obscure professor in Padua to arguably the most famous scientist in Europe. Galileo biographer James Reston Jr. has called the Starry Messenger, quote, the most important book of the 17th century, end quote. Galileo's contemporaries compared him favorably to many of the great explorers from the previous century. One English scientist wrote that, quote, Methinks my diligent Galileus hath done more in his threefold discovery than Magellan when he opened the strait to the South Sea. End quote. But my favorite ode to Galileo comes from a Scottish poet, Thomas Saget, who wrote this poignant comparison between Christopher Columbus and Galileo. Quote, 
Columbus gave man lands to conquer by bloodshed. Galileo knew worlds harmful to none. Which is better? End quote. I love that. It's also a nice reminder that even in the 1600s, there were people who were skeptical of the colonial project and understood its human cost. The moons of Jupiter weren't hurting anyone. Now, What I think is important for us to recognize about this period in Galileo's life is that the church was overwhelmingly quite supportive of Galileo. In the two-dimensional Galileo myth, the Roman Catholic Church is usually positioned as an unambiguous antagonist from the start. But this really wasn't the case. After the Jesuits confirmed Galileo's observations, they were officially certified by the Collegio Romano, the leading Jesuit seminary school. This meant that when Galileo went to Rome in 1611 to demonstrate his telescope and discuss his scientific discoveries, he was given a very friendly reception from various high-ranking church officials that he met with. The Jesuit mathematicians of the Collegio Romano even held a banquet in Galileo's honor. But the biggest test was going to be the reaction of the Pope. Pope Paul V has been remembered as the ultimate example of a counter-Reformation Pope. Before becoming Pope, he had been an expert on canon law, and as such, he styled himself as a law and order Pope. He was conservative, stern, and deeply concerned with the letter of canon law. He had no patience for rule breakers and believed in the harshest possible penalties for heretics and witches. He wasn't afraid to burn people at the stake. Pope Paul V was also a fierce protector of the church's traditional secular power. While Galileo had been living in Padua, the Pope had gone so far as to excommunicate the Doge and the entire Republic of Venice over a question of legal authority. If there was a Pope to fear, it was Pope Paul V. But Galileo's first meeting with the Pope in 1611 could not have gone any better. At that point, the church had not deemed Galileo's discoveries to be dangerous or heretical. If anything, they were pleased that a Roman Catholic and an Italian had been the man who had made these discoveries. When Galileo was given an audience with the Pope, Paul V made the magnanimous gesture of not having Galileo kneel for the entirety of their meeting. It was common for people of Galileo's stature to spend their entire audience on their knees. The fact that the Pope had him rise almost immediately was a great sign of respect. In the immediate wake of the Starry Messenger, which is arguably Galileo's most consequential piece of writing, the scientist wasn't branded a heretic, he wasn't excommunicated, he wasn't even investigated by the Inquisition. He was celebrated as a genius and was even saluted by a notoriously conservative pope. But, over the course of the next five years, the position of the Roman Catholic Church concerning the writings of Galileo would shift considerably. 1611 would not be the last time that Galileo would visit Rome, but it would be the last time that he would be feasted by churchmen. The next time he found himself in the Vatican, it would be under very different circumstances. Okay, that's all for this week. Join us again in two weeks' time when we will conclude our series on Galileo. Before we go this week, I need to give a shout out to the following people. Big ups to Matthew Goldenberg, to Maynard Linder, to Tanner McCleave, to Matthew Walson, to John Andre Sather, to Aaron Sweeney, to John Bryan, to 
Jian Rice, or Jian Rice, sorry about that pronunciation, to Sean Thornton, to Jessica Pruitt, to Dave White, to Caitlin Mural, to Tile Track, to Patreon, to Nancy Hoffman, to Christian Hayden, to Duncan, ooh, this next one's tricky, to Dead Edesius Christ, hmm, <laughs> to Cecilia M, to Patrick Booth, to Isa F. Villamil, to Lana Henderson, and to Steve Monday. All of these people have decided to pledge at $5 or more every month on Patreon. So you know what that means. They are beautiful human beings. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for your support. It means absolutely everything. Now that the podcast is my full-time job, uh, the support through Patreon means more than ever. Uh, if you want to support on Patreon, go to patreon.com slash history and see what level of support works for you. Or, as I said at the top of the show, go to OurFakeHistory.com, follow the link to the Tee Public store, and maybe buy a t-shirt or some other cool piece of merch. If you want to get in touch with me, you can always send me an email at OurFakeHistory at gmail.com. You can hit me up on Facebook, Facebook.com slash OurFakeHistory. You can find me on Twitter at OurFakeHistory. You can find me on Instagram at OurFakeHistory. As always, the theme music for the show comes to us from Dirty Church. You can check out Dirty Church at dirtychurch.bandcamp.com. And all the other music you heard on the show today was written and recorded by me. My name is Sebastian Major, and remember, just because it didn't happen doesn't mean it isn't real. What's up, everybody? It's All-Star and World Series champ Nick Swisher here, and I'm stoked to tell you about my new podcast, The Nick Swisher Show, right here on Podcast One. If you know me, you know I've worn a lot of hats in my career, and each one of them has had highs, lows, and a whole lot of learning in between. And that's exactly what I'm bringing to this podcast. You're going to get crazy interviews with athletes from their struggles to their successes and all their unbelievable superstitions along the way. You're going to hear from hometown heroes that are stepping up to the plate and making positive change and influences in their communities. I mean, we've got scientists, coaches, comedians. I'm telling you, whether you're an athlete, a parent, a coach, or just looking for a little energy in your life, then Home Plate is right here. It's old school soul with new school vibes. It's the Nick Swisher Show, coming soon wherever you get your podcasts.